Hi, it's Father Jeremiah of Grace Anglican Church here in Gastonia, North Carolina, and today I want to talk about August 15th and the Feast of St. Mary the Virgin. You heard that right. We have a feast day honoring the Blessed Virgin Mary. It feels weird for me to say it as the Feast of St. Mary the Virgin. St. Mary the Virgin. It's a weird way of putting it. I'm used to thinking of it as the Blessed Virgin Mary. When I speak of Mary, I often say the Virgin Mary or the Blessed Virgin Mary. I don't often think of it as St. Mary the Virgin. And so it's a weird way to phrase it, but it is how it is phrased. And it makes sense because Mary is a saint. And I think it's perfectly appropriate to call her St. Mary, even though it's not a phrase that I use very often. It's not a way of naming the Blessed Virgin Mary in my regular way of speaking. However, I've seen lots and lots of churches called St. Mary's. It never clicked in my head as like, oh, that's for the Blessed Virgin Mary. Or when it did, it didn't click in my head that, oh, I should call Mary St. Mary. Just one of those weird little ways of how one's mind works. But enough of that. Today is about this feast day and understanding it and considering it and seeing how it fits into our understanding of the faith as Anglicans. And as always, please do those three things I love to ask you to do. Hit the like button to let the algorithms know that you enjoyed this video. Hit the share button to share this with your friends on social media, whatever social media platform you're a part of. Any sharing of these videos helps others to discover us. And also, if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit the subscribe button and that bell icon and you should be notified whenever we upload new content, whenever we have live streams or new videos here on this channel. And I would appreciate all three of those things, especially the subscribing to us. Recently, we finally hit 400 subscribers. It's been a long haul moving from 300 up to 400. I thought it would be quicker, but it slowed down. But I'm overjoyed to hit 400 subscribers on our channel. It's a big milestone to me. I've never done a YouTube channel. This is the church's only YouTube channel, and it's been exciting to see it slowly grow over these last three and four years to where it is now. It still can grow a huge amount as people like and share these videos and others like you subscribe. So please subscribe to this video and help us to continue growing and making known what it is that we as Anglicans believe about the Christian faith. The feast day of St. Mary the Virgin. So why would we have a feast day to begin with to honor Mary? Well, I think that's a pretty easy question to answer. She is the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. She is the mother of the Savior of the world, known as the God-bearer, or colloquially speaking, the mother of God. Now this is a phrase that gets a lot of people ruffled, the mother of God. How, do you, how can you say a human being who is a creature could be the mother of God? Well, it's easy because Jesus Christ is both God and man. He is fully divine and fully human. In one person, he has two natures. Therefore, for the person of Jesus Christ to be born of the Virgin Mary, it means that God himself was born in the flesh through the Virgin Mary. Therefore, she is the mother of God. It is a statement acknowledging the true nature of Jesus Christ, that he is truly God and truly man. It's a way of securing that reality. It was an issue in the early church with Nestorius, who was not comfortable with that phrase, mother of God. He wanted to speak of Mary as the Christ bearer, but not the God bearer, because that would seem to say that God was a creature like us. But that's not what that phrase is saying. It's saying that Jesus is a true human being and thus had to be born of another human being, but he is also truly God, and if he is truly God, then God has been born in the flesh and taken on a true human nature. Therefore, Mary is the God-bearer. She is the mother of God, the one who gave birth to God in the flesh, so that that very God, Jesus Christ, could die for our sins. So that's one aspect of why we honor Mary on this day. Another aspect is that she was simply faithful throughout her life. She submitted to the will of God at the very beginning, when God made known to her through the angel that she would conceive a child who would be known as the Son of the Most High, and that he would be the Savior of the world, she didn't run away from it. She didn't, with doubt, question. She simply accepted. She was confused because, after all, she was a virgin. She was unmarried. How could she conceive and bear a child? She was con confused as to what would happen, how it would come about. But nonetheless, she still received what it was, and submitted to the will of God for her own life. Her will was submitted to God's will in that moment when she said, Let it be as you have said. I am your servant, the servant of the Lord. When she accepted the reality that God was at work, that he was going to cause her to conceive a child, the Son of God, who would bear the sins of the world, she submitted to the work of God in her. 
She submitted to the will of God for her to walk this path of being the mother of the Savior, the mother of the Messiah, the mother of God in the flesh. That's a huge thing. And we should honor Mary. The text there in Luke 1 says that she shall be blessed among all. She shall be remembered among all the women, the most blessed of all, because of what she is willing to do, because she is submitting to the will of God. And that's a glorious thing for us to consider in Luke 1 and how she is praised for submitting to the will of God. And we should honor that. We should recognize the importance of that reality. And so in that sense, that's why we recognize Mary and have a feast day for her is to recognize the great depth of her faith to accept the reality that she would bear the Son of God into this world and that she would walk faithfully along with him. And there are many other stories in the Gospels about Mary. She is with Jesus at the wedding at Cana and told the servants to listen to him, to pay attention to what he told them to do. She was with Jesus at the cross as he was dying there beside the Apostle John when Jesus said, Woman, behold your son, and John, behold your mother. As Jesus was dying, he passed his mother's care on to John the Apostle, and John took her into his own household from then on. Different traditions say where Mary ultimately died. We know that John eventually ends up in Ephesus and serves there as, a, as the Apostle in residence in Ephesus for many, many years, and it, some traditions say that Mary died there because she went with him there. Others say that she died not that long after that, about 10 or 12 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So around 41, 42 AD, she passed away there in Jerusalem before John had traveled out of that area. But we don't know where she died. And that takes us to the second aspect of the strangeness of this feast for some of us who are from very low Protestant backgrounds. In the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox side of things, in their understanding on this feast day, there is something called the Assumption of Mary or the Dormition of Mary. These two concepts overlap greatly with each other, and I'm just going to explain a little bit about it. This is not a massive theological treatise on the rightness or the wrongness of this belief. I'm not getting into that. I just want to explain what it is that they believe. And so with this concept of the Assumption or the Dormition of Mary, there is the reality that Mary's body is nowhere to be found. We don't know where Mary is. And so there is the belief that after her death, that she died peacefully, and after her death, her soul ascended into heaven, just as our souls will for all faithful believers to await the resurrection of the dead, but that God then sent his angels to take Mary's body and bring it into heaven. In some of those traditions, her body and her soul and body are reunited, and she is living a resurrected life now in heaven. Other traditions, which are not as accepted these days, say that her body was buried elsewhere. One tradition says that her body was taken and buried under the tree of life there in heaven, awaiting the day of resurrection, the day of the kingdom coming. That's kind of a neat picture. But that her body was just as important as her soul, and so the Lord took her body away. And so, she is in heaven now. Some say with her body. Some might say it's buried with the tree of life, under the tree of life, waiting for that day of resurrection. Another side of this theory, this legend, is that before she even died, she was just simply assumed body and soul into heaven, much like Enoch and Elijah. These were pious understandings in the early church that really came into the fore in the late 4th century and 5th century, especially toward the middle of the 5th century and on. These ideas of Mary ascending into heaven, so to speak, being assumed into heaven, being the better language, sorry, I shouldn't have said ascended, she was assumed into heaven, body and soul. Some say prior to her death, others say after her death. And thus her soul ascended first, her soul went to heaven first, and then her body came after that. And so that's one aspect of this feast day for Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, and a few Anglicans. Some Anglicans hold to that belief. No one is required to believe that belief, and some don't, and most don't in the Anglican Church, but some do, and it's not required for anyone. I'm not sure that you can prove it either way. Can God do anything he wants? Yes, he can. Is there a biblical revelation explaining that this is what God did? No, but there is no biblical revelation about any of the travels of the apostles beyond their immediate work there in Jerusalem, their traditions within history about where they went, how they were martyred, and for the most part, we accept those traditions because no one's required to believe them to begin with. So, with Mary, she passed on. She died. She fell asleep, you can say, as it is so often described for the saints dying in the New Testament that they fell asleep. And her soul, we know, is in heaven. We believe and trust that it is in heaven because of the faithfulness we saw throughout her life, that she obeyed the will of God. And that's what the center of this feast day is about for us as Anglicans, is, is that obedience 
of the mother of God, of Mary, to become the mother of God and to raise Jesus and to be there with him throughout his life, to care for him and to raise God in the flesh, Emmanuel, for the sake of the world. And we have a collect for this day. The collect is just simply for St. Mary the Virgin. And it is prayed like this. O God, you have taken to yourself the blessed Virgin Mary, mother of your incarnate Son, Grant that we, who have been redeemed by his blood, may share with her the glory of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so at that, may we be partakers of that eternal kingdom, just as we trust that she will be, just as based on the faithfulness we see in Scripture. And that she is the mother of God, the mother of the incarnate Son of God. And she bore God in the flesh and brought him into this world and raised him. That he might redeem us all from our sins by his death and his resurrection. For all of those who have faith in him and the work he has accomplished. And so may the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us always. Amen.